Welcome back to Autism Live. We've been sharing a lot of fun things with you, toys and the like, and sometimes you need a palate cleanse, right? So we have a special treat for you today. Christina Adams is joining us via Skype, and you guys know Christina because she's a regular here on the show. We do Autism and Beyond with Christina Adams. She's the author of A Real Boy, one of my favorite books having to do with autism. And Christina's a bit of a world traveler. Uh, she came to us a few months ago and we had a sit down where we talked about Cuba, which was fascinating. A lot has happened in Cuba since then. But recently, Christina went to India for, it seemed like you were gone forever, Christina, and you were posting some pictures uh, while you were gone, but we both agreed we needed to get you in studio talking a little bit about what you were doing there. And I love getting these checkups from you about what autism is like in different places in the world. So first of all, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Always glad to be here, Shannon. It's such a thrill. So how long were you in India? It seemed like you were gone forever. I was there for quite a while. It's such a long trip that you want to make the most of it. But it turned out that I actually had quite a few events there. So honestly, probably about three and a half weeks. So it was a long time. It was a very long time. Now, let's start with why. Why did you go? Why did you say, hey, you know, I want to go to India um, in the first place? What was it about India? I mean, it's exotic and it's fabulous. But what really drew you to it? Well, I was lucky enough to visit India in 2009. And ever since then, I've been dying to go back. And as my work with autism and family milk, of course, has progressed, I have heard from so many people all around the world. And India is a place that they were very interested in camel milk uh, because they do have camels there. It's actually the heritage animal of Rajasthan, which is the legendary home of you know, palaces and uh, deserts and all the beautiful imagery you associate with India. Uh, the camel is a state animal, but like all the other camel countries, a lot of the people have lost touch with uh, camel milk. So now that people are kind of aware of this as a uh, first line kind of easy therapy that they want to try it that way, then I hear from them. And what that does is open up the world of autism uh, as, me, as far as me being able to assist them. So people that are in the professional realm ask me to come over and help raise awareness, not only of camel milk, but how autism families can get help for their children and raise awareness of you know the value of uh, the pastoral people that provide camel milk but also how autism is a growing issue around the world and so i'm able to you know give all the help uh, guidance that i can give them when i'm over there also talking about camel milk well and, if, and for people who don't know you are an autism mom you've written a, a book uh, a real boy a, about your journey in the early years of autism with your son but it's I, I cannot wait, and I know you've been talking about and kind of working on, I don't want to uh, you know say anything, but there better be a new book soon, because your story, quite honestly, somebody needs to make a movie. Um, because how uh, a United States autism mom ends up being one of the pivotal people in talking about camel milk around the world, that's an exciting story. I'm telling you, uh, and I know parts of the story, but somebody needs, you You need to get the book because somebody needs to write the movie uh, and get this movie done. And there are actresses that are dying to play you. Um, so I'll say that. But uh, I, and, and it's not just me that thinks this is fascinating. The world does. In fact, Samantha's got a clip that shows when you arrived in India, some of the newspapers um, we're, we're talking about this because it's a great story. How does this American mom, uh, what's, what's the story with her and camel milk and autism? And I love this. Uh, I, first of all, look at you on that TV screen. It's just amazing the difference that you're making around the world. It's very, it gives me goosies. So you went to, oh, you, you went to India, you arrived and when there was all this fuss about you, did you had you known that there was going to be a big stir about you being there? Or was that a little bit of a pleasant surprise? It was uh, not anything that one could ever expect. So uh, I had been invited to come by uh, the uh, LPPS, the League of Pastoral uh, Peoples, and their national. I mean, it's called an NGO, which is um, a kind of a non-governmental organization, is what that means. People that are just basically trying to help people around the world. And so they had been aware of my work, 
And then once they invited me, then other people kind of got in, into uh, wanting to have me come and speak. So when I, when I landed there, uh, just spent one night in Mumbai, you know, on our way, because that was a very long trip from America. And uh, so then I was uh, going to Jaipur, which is, um, you know, a very important city in Rajasthan, and uh, it's the capital. And uh, so I did not expect that I would get right off the plane and go straight to a TV studio and do a shoot uh, with uh, a show. It's actually a one-hour show with uh, one of their top broadcasters there and journalists. And that was a wonderful experience. It was quite head-turning in its speed, uh, but it went really well, I think. So the next day, we had an event, and it turned out that with the TV show hadn't even aired yet, but the first newspaper article had come out in the Rajasthan Patrika, which is uh, the eighth largest newspaper uh, group in India, I believe. And so people just came to that event, which was supposed to be relatively small, and they just came and came and came, and they had an overflow crowd. There were all kinds of people that were interested in it, and even there were people outside listening on loudspeakers, and uh, I'm not alone, of course, um, on that stage. There are some really legendary people in the camel world. There is a scientist who has shown uh, that camel milk um, helps with the diabetes situation um, in uh, Rajasthan, and uh, probably beyond that, there uh, was a government minister of animal husbandry. Uh, there was the Dr. Ilsa, who was uh, you know, a person I've worked with before, who was a Rolex award winner for her work in helping the camel herding people, and um, some other people there. But when, the, when, the, when, all, when we all spoke and the event was over, just it's hard to explain it. The autism families basically just came up to the stage and just pushed uh, their way up to the stage and in a very polite way they were great people but just overwhelmed there was crowds there were people yelling and grabbing the microphone to try to get their questions out and I had to say please please I'll try to help all of you and they um, they were going to have a reception after but they had to cancel that because there were so many people there so that just shows all of us in the autism world, what the need is for people to have information. Absolutely. And then you spent some time uh, with some herders, uh, but it was it was a fair of some sort. Talk to us about well, that. Well, one of the, yeah, one of the reasons that I got to come over there too was because there's a really famous thing called the, the push car camel fair. And of course, ever since I got into this, this camel world a few years ago, when I realized that, you know, giving my son camel milk helped his autism symptoms uh, by 30%, as I've said before, um, I've, I've known about this legendary pushcar camel fair where all these people bring their camels to trade and sell them and uh, horses come in and it's just a, a really huge event. And there have been thousands and thousands and thousands of camels there in the past. So this year, when I finally get to go, I wanted to find out what was going on with the camel situation. Unfortunately, it the camel is dropping in its use and its uh, ability to exist in Rajasthan. So there I am sitting on the ground with um, the Rika people. And I've communicated with Rika people before, and so it was great to meet them in person. And I'm hearing about their struggles because these are um, people that believe that they're, they were created, they're a special caste, that believe they were created uh, by Lord Shiva to take care of camels. It's their, their, their you know, modus operandi in life. And so now that camels have been um, kind of restricted in their movements and, and their uses uh, by some laws that, um, you know, are well-intentioned, I'm sure, but as like most laws, it takes a while to work things out. Unfortunately, there's not an economic use for camels anymore. So this fair was very sad because last year there were 10,000 camels. This year the official count was, I think, around 2,800. Wow. So it was very That's depressing. a huge difference. But you also got to spend some time uh, with people in the village and some of the women um, and uh, learning about their lifestyle. We have a couple of pictures that we want to show uh, of you talking with the women in the village. Uh, and then we want to, uh, I love the, the clothes. I mean, I said this to you, but when you were sending the pictures, uh, that the clothes that you're, I just, I want to start dressing this way. I just want to say that. It had to have been comfortable and cool, and yet you're sheltered from the sun. It's, it's just, and I love the colors and the prints and being able to wear two different color prints. Was it liberating for you? It was fantastic, and I always did like Indian clothes since I discovered them, but um, uh, before I went, I said, well, what's, what's the proper dress for me to wear? And they said, well, really, Indian people appreciate it if you, wanna, if you wear their clothing. It makes them feel like you're you know, taking notice of, 
of them and, and trying to, you know, show oneness with them. I was like, great, because I love their clothing. I have some, but I have more. So, uh, yes, um, I did. And um, it was comfortable. It was great. And they are so great with style. The whole country, so many people just have so much beauty around them that their heritage crafts have taught them to appreciate and, and to integrate into their decor. So the buildings have these beautiful touches. Um, the people have beautiful touches. And their concept, I learned a few things about dressing, was it should have contrast. Ah. And it should not be matchy-matchy all the time. So, you know, color blocking is about the best that we've been able to do over here. But that's nothing compared to the way that they can integrate color and pattern. And also every day you put on a beautiful scarf, uh, which is called a dupada. And so you have that kind of nice feminine element. Um, you have garments that are comfortable and they can be very flattering, but they don't show everything. And you don't generally show your legs um, in Indian society. So um, personally, as somebody you know that likes to wear whatever I want to wear, including pants or dresses, I like having like a dress on, but then also kind of pants underneath it. Um, gives you kind of a nice um, ease of comfort. Like if you're going to get down on the ground with people, yeah. if you're going to move around, climb in and out of um, you know the auto rickshaws or on a motorbike, because a lot of them do. Um, or in a cart, you know, if they're more rural people, then, then it's very freeing. I love it. You know, there's a trend now here in the United States that most schools, when girls wear dresses to school, they now have to wear shorts underneath or leggings. And, so, and I love that. Um, I, I just, I, I would dress that way all the time if I could. Uh, so I might, uh, <laughs> moving forward. But you sent us some video. What are we going to see in this video, Christina? Okay, so this is when I was on the ground at Pushkar, which of course is a famous place. And here now I'm hanging out with these uh, wonderful guys, uh, almost all men. They did cook for me. It was very kind. And we had a translator, a, a Rika a person that I've been communicating with. Um, he translated for us. So I'm kind of realizing the impact of what I'd read about. I was there and I saw how this great heritage is, is crumbling. Okay, so let's take a look at that clip. So we're looking around at how many camels are here this year and we're told the official count is 2,800 and about three or four years ago it was around 10,000. So I had heard that the camel business in Rajasthan is struggling and I'm here today to see that it, it certainly is. You see a lot of bare ground where there should be nothing but camels and uh, the brokering is going on right now. Some people are selling the camels, but some people are getting offered such low prices they're not even going to sell them, like these, these three right here. They, the cam they were offered two-thirds two of the, no, one-third of the price that, that he wanted, so it's not worth it to him. He'll try to sell them someplace else. We keep talking about buying a camel. <laughs> You and I have talked about how we need to have like a timeshare and people buying a camel. So that's where, not that we want to take advantage of their low prices, but um, fascinating that, you know, at a time when you're saying these camels and the camel milk from them can help with all kinds of different ailments, um, that the camel herders are having a crisis and not being able to get money for their camels and uh, that the industry yeah. seems to be shrinking. It's a, it's a but, but in the United States, the funny, yeah, in the United States, actually, though, the prices are doubled since I started. Yeah. So it's, it's like every country is different. So and around the world, camels are actually the third fastest growing livestock, and they are doing great. It's just in this, this particular area that, you know, the, um, there's a lot of issues behind it, but we did, um, you know, I, I got my I got my boots on the ground there, and then we went forward, and I did speak at some more um, events where other great uh, people that can contribute to policy were there, uh, and I was really amazed that I got to be around such amazing people that I have admired from a distance for so long. So this is the Marwar Camel Camel Fair, is that correct? Where you spoke? Yes, it is, and uh, that was the stage. They had a giant tent, and it was attended by um, all so many uh, local Rika herders um, who herd camel, sheep, and goats. And uh, so they're they're out in the audience, and then on stage were a lot of policymakers, government people, and then also um, people like myself that just don't really, you know, get. It's not an economic thing for me. It's just a passion that. I want to see um, this great creature that has so much to contribute to us survive because it's being used in um, other things like 
the development of uh, cures for snake bite, for STDs, for cancer research, um, and it's a great animal for global warming. So not only is it benefiting the autism community, its uh, potential is really terrific. And the interest was there. You were, you we're looking now at you in this beautiful golden tent, uh, and you're wearing a beautiful dress. Uh, where, it seems like wherever you went, there were people who were like, give us more information about this. I love this picture. Are these herders? Those are, uh, yes, they are the Rika people, um, and there are different, um, you know, castes as well, but uh, mostly Rika people there. And yes, th their whole culture has been formed around camels and the land and uh, grazing and natural type of lifestyle. So it was just an amazing thing to see autism families and professionals, medical professionals for humans and um people for camels come all in one place under one roof. I, I never, I was thrilled when I was there because it's just one of those things you could never predict in life that you will be able to bring such disparate communities together and try to help each one. And by the way, that photo was a family that had driven really far to see me. A lot of them had. And um, this this lovely child, he, uh, he has you know quite a few autism things to deal with. I personally can see that he's bright and he has potential. But they have never had behavioral help. They have never had um, a lot of intervent, you know, interventions. So right now, I was already able to connect them to a parenting program. What a wonderful thing! What a wonderful thing! And then, uh, as you did when you were in Cuba, you did a little bit of recon to try to see what's happening with these kids. What kind of therapies are they getting? Where are they in school? And you found a pretty amazing place. Tell us about it. Well, I was so lucky that when this organization, um, they uh, found out that I was going to come and they had a conference. So they were actually having a national conference. It was bigger than I expected. So first they invited me to visit their school. And it is the school for multiply handicapped children or multiply disabled children. People don't really say handicapped too much anymore, even though some parts of the world they still do. But here they say, you know, a resource center for multiple disabilities. So. Um, they have done incredible things, and they're doing amazing things with people that have the children and young adults that have multiple disabilities. So this is the inside of Disha. It's quite an impressive building, um, and uh, they also have things like speech therapy, physical therapy, um, aquatic therapy. And yeah, there's a speech therapist. He's very talented. They're using computers. Um, they're here, they're using a program to get the child to interact and talk back and, and push, you know, volume out of his voice. They had, uh, you know, the visual teaching aids. And what I think was also really cute was that culturally, you notice that they have to learn different things than, than we do. So there's some Hindi, I assume. And then, you know, they have to learn what's a monkey, um, you know, what's a, a, a cockatoo, a parrot. Um, there's a milk jug that, you know, milk is taken around the city in. So um, it's the same concept of teaching, of course, that we might use over here if you're using um, like a, you know, picture visual system. But it's just kind of cute. It, it just tells how we all basically have the same needs, no matter if our environment is different around the world. Absolutely. And, you know, in general, when in, in this trip, you were there for almost a month. Um, a beautiful, beautiful country, but a country that's not without its challenges. Well, what was your takeaway from this place? Well, um, India is, you know, a, a very, very, very large place, and it's had quite a history. You know, it's been influenced by different cultures like the Mughal culture uh, many years ago, which has given way to, you know, the arches and some Islamic type uh, influence that makes some beautiful palaces which I was lucky to visit some on when I squeezed a couple in. And then they also, you know, have colonized by the British for a long time. So um, it's a collection of states. It's a huge country with a collection of states, and they all have their own identity. So I spent most of my time in Rajasthan and got to know it quite, um, quite well, considering them just a tourist there. Um, but, you know, knowing people on the ground that can show you what's, what's going on behind was uh, what made the difference. And so I guess, you know, my impression was, of course, of the beauty, the, the architecture. That's a beautiful temple near Udaipur, which is the city of lakes. You couldn't ask for a more beautiful city um, as far as its views and palaces. And, of course, you drive down the road and you see a monkey here and there. And mm -hmm. um, 
So it definitely is exotic. And, you know, and, and there are the road, there's the highway, and then you have, you know, a herd of, um, uh, you know, oxen or water buffalo or I'm not sure exactly they are from this street view. But, yeah, there's, there's animals in the street. Um, there's my taxi, my driver. He has, you know, his guru on the dashboard. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it was beautiful. I got to go to a temple, and I amazingly, they had an honor for me. They gave me um, a marigold garland and, and, you know, kind of thanked me for being there to help uh, people. So I found India, my takeaway. It was amazingly rich wonderful culture with the food and all that that I enjoyed. Yeah. Um, and on the right is a sheep herder meal um, that the ladies made for me. And on the left is a, kind of like a truck stop and see they have it even great food at the truck stop. Wow. Um, but I also find it to be a very spiritual place and that's a cliche, but I'll say that people were very, um, very, uh, they never expressed, they never he hesitated to express like their take on the emotional value of the work that I was there to do, you know, wishing me luck um, and um, trying to, you know, say that they hope that people with disabilities can be, you know, integrated into society. Um, they do kind of have an awareness of that, um, that they overlay into their, their dealings, at least with me in the limited time that I had with them. And people were, were very um, emotionally connecting things with, you know, their daily life and what I was doing there. So that was nice. Well, and, uh, you know, uh, I, have we talked about the fact that you spoke at the disability conference at, at Disha yet? Did we already talk about that? I don't remember if we did. Because, no, no uh, yeah. Let's, de let's yeah. definitely talk about that. But I, I also want to say, too, since we're on this other subject, is that um, I think it's very easy, especially at this time of the year, to get caught up in other things, <laughs> right? And a lot of t and literally get caught up in things. And, and what's always interesting to me when you visit us and you talk about these faraway places that I can only imagine, I'm not a world traveler, bless you, because I love to look at the pictures, but you know, I'm somebody who likes to stay home. Um, but I love hearing about these different and exotic places, but hearing that there's a taproot that we're all the same. And when I hear that there are families in India that have, I mean, there are friends that we have that watch the show and, and they talk about the resources that they don't have, but they're building up more and more. And to see that there is a school and that there is a program and there is a plan um, makes me really happy and reminds me that yes. we might be in different places, but a lot of times we're dealing with the same core issues. And, um, yes. and that's important for us to remember at all times of the year. But so talk to us a little bit about you spoke at Disha. Yes, um, Disha... What an amazing group of women have thrown their social uh, uh, capital and their intellect, which is remarkable, behind starting this school in Jaipur. So they've been at it for a few years, and it's just amazing. So they actually had the resources to put together this conference, which even though it's in a region, it was a national conference. And there were government ministers. Um, there, was, there were many speeches. There, were much, there was much tea drunk. Um, it was it was a very large conference, and I have to say it was kind of a, a ground um, a groundswell that led to this because there's more and more awareness of disabilities. Autism was just one issue at this conference, but everybody had gave up and gave their kind of position statement that the government needs to do this, and some of the ministers are like, yes, we need to do this. We want to raise awareness. So early stage, but the um, the importance of the gesture, and then all the practical information that was given later at the conference when the, when the government statements were given, uh, later there were the boots on the ground type of, you know, presentations given. It was a really probably a landmark for the area. Amazing. So just to recap, you, you went and you um, were part of a larger discussion about disabilities and autism, but, and you were there and connected with people about camel milk and the importance of using camel milk for different medicinal uses. But you also, one of the things we sort of skipped over when we were talking about the issue with the camels is that you were a part of uh, making a, a statement to the government about helping the camel herders, correct? Yes, I was very fortunate um, that um, when I was at the Marwar Camel Festival, 
Um, other people had put a great deal of effort into this policy paper, but um, I was invited to go on the stage and with the other group, and we presented the draft of this uh, so the media could see it and people were aware of, you know, the value. So it's it's sort of the attempt to, um, you know, it's a policy paper to show how we can save the, the Rajasthan uh, heritage animal. So um, let's see if it falls on um, some you know, ears that are receptive. And I think that with the media we got and people being aware of how um, camel milk is just one thing that could be a valuable economic resource and it could help so many people, um, both the people that produce it and the people that need it, then um, there may be some groundswell there. So we're looking forward right now to see what's going to happen out of that. Wow. And um, at the Disha conference, yes, um, I did give a presentation on autism and camel milk, but I also talk about autism a little bit for the people that aren't really aware of autism, but you know they, they're starting from a, from behind us there. So my whole goal was to raise awareness of autism and um, how important it is that the people that have autism are wonderful kids or adults and that they have great potential. And then, then the families need the support, the children themselves need the support, and that um, no one will regret helping them because it's such a great value to society. Well, you're such an amazing person, Christina, and you lead a very exciting life that is very well deserved and earned. And I love that you are going to these places and doing this work. I think that it's really super. We're looking forward to in 2018 spending some more time with you. You've got uh, a very exciting film that's a documentary that's about your son that's going to be coming out. And we're going to uh, have you back on the show and maybe even have him on the show to talk about this lovely short film. And that's going to be coming up in January. So we thank you for all that you do and for dropping by to tell us about it. Where can people go if they want to get more information about you, about Camel Milk, or your trip in India? Well, I uh, have a website just because people wrote me so often, I decided I need to have one. And um, it's ChristinaAdamsAuthor.com. ChristinaAdamsAuthor.com. You could message me through there. I'm also on Facebook, and uh, I get my messages through there. And you can email me too. And my email is CAdams at XIQLLC.com. And I'll love to hear from you. Thank you so much for all that you do. I, You know I just adore you and think that you are amazing. And don't forget, you guys, A Real Boy. If you haven't read it yet, man, get it now so that when she comes out with the second book, you'll, you'll, know, you'll know, okay, that's where we were and this is where we are because it's kind of an amazing journey. And I, and I think you got to look out for who's going to make the film. <laughs> I would like to look out for anything could happen because I know so many people need the information. It's just difficult to to get a message that's, you know, not the normal message out there. But yes, I'm do, I'll do my best. It's an amazing story. Uh, your story is an amazing story. But first, we're going to talk about, uh, in January, we're going to talk about the documentary made about your son. So we'll come back in January for that. But thank you. And if I don't see you beforehand, happy holidays and happy new year. Okay, and same to you. And um, happy holidays to you and everyone at uh, Autism Live.